My name is Kieran O'Leary. Um, I work in digital collections at the Irish Fulham Archive. Uh, so this is going to be like a much less technical talk than the last one I did. This is sort of more um, our journey over the last two or so years and how we kind of heard about F51 um, and some of the obstacles we had to overcome in order to do so. So it's called When Vendors Say No. Um, and it's about our dealings with one particular vendor who sold us their media processing software to facilitate our workflows. And it isn't an attack on vendors by any means. Um, we've worked with several vendors over the years, in particular Digital Garage in the UK, and we continue to be really happy with them. But this isn't about them. Um, it's just about ones that didn't, they weren't really that open to open source. So in order to understand why we gravitated towards FFV1, um, and the Trotsky in the first place, it's best if I just tell you a little bit about the Irish Film Archive. So, the actual Film Archive is just one part of a larger Irish Film Institute, um, which also has like a commercial three-screen art house and independent uh, cinema, restaurant, bar, education, kind of outreach departments, um, and many more. So, only about 25% of our funding comes from the Arts Council, which is like an Irish government uh, funding body. The rest has to be generated through our commercial activities or through overarching preservation agreements with stakeholders such as the Irish Film Board, the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, and the Arts Council. And even those three, there's a, potentially a variety of media there. There's like um, DCPs, DCDNs coming from the Film Board, but occasionally um, if you get AS11 um, deliverables too, mostly it's AS11s from uh, Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, and you could get really anything from the Arts Council. A lot of um, experimental kind of uh, art films. And stuff like that. So, um, what kind of concerns us today, though, are the amateur and professional uh, film collections, uh, our analog and digital tape formats, and the born digital material. So, in 2014, the seven full-time staff members of the archive, uh, we're up to 11 now, um, but back then this, there were seven of us, uh, we were investigating the uh, creation of a digital archive, and it was instigated to a, uh, to a certain degree by some of these stakeholders who wanted to give us porn digital deliveries. They no longer wanted to give DigiBeta, HDCam, and 35 mil prints. So, um, my, like everybody split up into all these different kind of research groups and one group that I want to kind of focus on here was um, the combination of my two colleagues, Colin Gilna and Anja Mahler, who's actually from Germany, I think from Halloween. And the two of them were kind of just researching um, metadata and workflows. So um, it was kind of like finding appropriate metadata standards and best practice workflows for processing digitized and born digital material. And their research formed like the basis of our principles over the last three years. And a key document that was highlighted at that time was just seven principles of digitization. And one of those key principles was to use open formats and avoid proprietary formats. And this was something that kind of would never have been on our radar. Um, Kind of thinking about codex and stuff like that, but when we were thinking about codex, it would be what's the easiest thing to use with such and such, such uh, software or something. And so Colin and Andrew were like, they really pressed this point home, and we all eventually bought into it. And the bit that I want to kind of draw your attention to is this bit here about how open technologies are less vulnerable to technical obsolescence. Support for a proprietary format can disappear along with a single company who developed it, but this is not so for an open technology. Proprietary file formats can safely be used for delivery, but should never be used for long-term preservation where open alternatives exist. So, um, Simon Factor of Movie Media, who um, is a consultant that has uh, helped us throughout the creation of our digital archive and continues to work with us today, he had heard um, that NOAA and the Austrian MediaTek were using FFV1 in ABI. So that was the first time we ever heard of this codec. Um, 
So at the time, there wasn't really much information in, about the codec in 2014, but thankfully the Austrian Media Tech uh, posted a lot of their results online. Um, Peter Bubenstanger as well was um, invaluable. Um, and like, if, look, if there wasn't that sort of uh, public access to information about this format, um, as well as comparisons to other uncompressed and lossless um, codecs, we would not have pursued FFV1 as much as we did at the time. It would have just been a, a buzzword that we heard, and we would have moved on. So just kudos to the media tech. So the key issue for us at the very start when we were investigating all these formats was actually the openness, the um, non-proprietary nature. We weren't even considering lossless compression or anything at this stage. Um, but the more we heard about it, that became quite important because we are a small, under, underfunded archive. So, why FFE1? Well, I don't need to go into this very much. This is, um, this is what was appealing to us at the time. Actually, the last one came a little bit later. We didn't even realize that there was the potential for RGB DPX support. But now that we know that, um, there's something kind of nice about having one format for your tape and your films, especially when you have tools like MediaConch to uh, validate your files. So, these, um, like nowadays, I would add some new things to that, like the fact that FFV1 is more of a self describing codec, it doesn't leave a lot of significant properties to the container, and uh, the embedded fixity as well, the, the embedded uh, CRCs are. Uh, invaluable for an archive. So, like we had a rough outline of what we wanted to include in our archival information packages, and back in 2014, this consisted of a video file, a checksum, some technical metadata in the form of a uh, media info, a verbose media info output, uh, and we're doing a lot more than that now, and we want to continue to do more and make our archival packages uh, more robust, but that's where we were at in 2014. And so that kind of, um, oh yeah, this is an artist's representation of our desire for FFB1. He does no logo for FFB1, so, um, so this was like the, this was, um, I was telling my girlfriend about this, she, she's an artist, and I was always comparing scripts and stuff to robots, like we were generating robots, so that's the FFB1 robot that we wanted to build. And that's all the film cans and the sad face within the computer. So, um, yeah, so look, that, Concept, that archival package, which is quite basic, that was determining what we wanted from our software. Um, like, could it tick all those boxes? And if so, um, then great, like, let, let's have it. So, automation was really important. We um, were short staffed, so the more that can be uh, done by the robots, the better. So, um, I'm not going to name the software because. Um, I'm just going to call it like unnamed vendor software or the vendor software for this talk. Like, I don't want to name it for several reasons, and one of them is that naming and shaming isn't relevant to this or any symposium, I don't think. Um, another reason is that I don't think that we did everything we could to advocate for FFV1 and MKD and for open source. Uh, we surely could have done a lot more, but that was mostly because we just didn't know enough at the time. Um, so it's not fair to them because like this was meant for production houses, a, a film and TV production workflow, and it's just another one of those kind of pieces of software that an archive kind of reappropriated for their own use. Um, so like what it would do is that there would be like a, a watch folder on a network. You would uh, drag and drop your file in, and then that would uh, generate watermark access copies. Um, it didn't create just like a media info XML, it had like a customized schema, which was really weird. And uh, yeah, it was very strange. And then it added the MD5 checksum into the media info XML. But I guess some fixity is better than no fixity. And then that would move it, uh, the file to like another watch folder and it would get written to LTO. So like, it didn't do a huge amount in the grand scheme of things, but those things were quite meaningful to us at the time because if we were to make like um, an access copy, for example. Initially, that was a manual process of opening up Final Cut, bringing your file, adding a watermark, um, a time code, file, export, and then you can't do anything in Final Cut while you're waiting for that to generate. And I know there's other ways you could probably do it, but um, you know, this was just you know, less hassle and stuff. So um, 
Yeah, so as I said, much more suited to maybe like a media production department. So we were pretty interested in FFV1. So um, I began running a lot of tests using various epithentic frontends because um, I, I didn't really want to use the command line at the time. Um, so for everything, I kind of wanted a GUI, a graphical user interface. These GUIs didn't really support FFV1 out of the box. You sometimes had to put in a manual like codec ID or something. And uh, generally, uh, it wasn't that great, but eventually we found a few um, front ends that supported FFV1, and it just it worked exactly as the MediaTek kind of said it would. It was really good compression, it was really fast, and um, we didn't have a way yet of verifying if the files were actually lost, but we'll come to that later. So, a big deal breaker here was, if we were going to implement FFV1, there had to be some automation. Yeah, we weren't going to like open up that front end and bring in a file and make an FFV1, or even on the command line, like it, this kind of drop folder kind of thing was really important. So we got in touch with the vendor and said, can you add support for FFV1 and Petroska, or just FFV1? And they got back to us and, in a, you know, that was roughly it. So then we had, you know, the follow-up was, can you add it? And not for the super future, because there was no demand. It was, you know, why would you need that in a media production archive? Or a media production workflow. <coughs> um, and so, that was kind of that for a while. Um, it was a kind of a disheartening moment for me and I think some of my colleagues because um, it kind of became quite clear that we were really reliant on this vendor. And even though initially like we chose that software because it complemented our workflows, eventually when our workflows began to develop, uh, the software wasn't really moving with us. <coughs> so um, there wasn't really like a command line culture or a scripting culture in the archive, so some you know, this, like, do it yourself concept wasn't really there. We were reliant on a, on a vendor. Um, we began investigating other formats um, that might tick some of those boxes in the seven principles of digitization. Um, we looked at like JPEG 2000 and Huff uh, YUV or however you pronounce it. Uh, generally, like uh, most of the things that we were looking at, we they ended up being kind of closed source proprietary implementations. Um, maybe we weren't always looking at the right things, but we just kind of going around in circles. The JPEG 2000 was quite tempting to us because we were already taking in like AS11 MXF, so that was you know a similar container, different profile probably. Um, and we were taking in lossy JP2000 as our digital cinema packages. So I mean, there was some sort of or potential for harmony there maybe, but anyway, that didn't really work out. So uh, another thing was um, the head of our archive, Cassandra O'Connell, um, published our digital preservation and access strategy. And part of that was, there was a real emphasis on scalability and flexibility. And this vendor lock didn't really, um, sit with that very well. But there was like one little bit of, of hope, right? Um, like the, the vendor software had all these little tasks you could put through on this like workflow. It could be like, you know, make um, MPEG-2, make MP4, make watermark. And it had this blank slate, which was a uh, command line node. And you could just put in some command line, um, or just a command, it would outsource the work and move it along. And so that was like, FFV1 was now supported. You know, and it was, that seemed nice, I guess. Um, but, like, the problem I had with that was, like, that was a pretty simple workaround. Why didn't they try to support it? You know, like, did they not investigate it? Did we not do enough to tell them that FFV1 was available as part of FFmpeg and that you could just outsource it? Um, but there was another thing. Look, it, it supported it now, but we get to the frame and 5 stuff. And, um, this has come up a few times. Uh, I mentioned it as well in, in my demonstration the last day, and I won't go into it too much because I think we have an idea of what it does now. It kind of analyzes um, every frame, decodes it to raw video, um, and produces an MD5 checksum. And the idea being your FF or your, let's say, your uncompressed 10 bit source decodes it, and then that decoded output is an MD5 value comes from it. Same thing happens with the FFV1, it's decoded to raw video. So like the raw video transcode of the FFV1 and the B210 should be identical, so they should produce identical MD5s. 
And then because you have this sheet full of empty files, you've got this automated way, machine uh, automated way, of doing lossless verification. So all that sort of stuff, like it doesn't happen, that three-step process, you can't do it with um, any kind of GUIs or anything like that. Um, and you definitely shouldn't do it with this tool. And a lot of our transcoding was happening on a network, and I became really worried about the reliability of the lossless process. So I, um, we didn't even really bother asking the vendor to support this sort of a workflow, because if they weren't going to do FFP1 in the first place, this definitely would be you know. But like, this was a real game changer for us, because FFP1 became a significantly more attractive um, possibility, because now we had this lossless verification, and also it made our archival packages that bit more robust, because we had this frame level fixity for all of our video files. Um, so, yeah, so with some help from Dave Rice, um, who wrote that blog um, where I first discovered the frame MP5 even was a thing, um, we ended up creating some bash scripts on OSX. Um, and these were largely like um, copied and from Dave's pre existing make lost the script, which he mentioned earlier on. And, but like, you know, we could have just reused that, but I wanted to learn kind of how to do this um, and maybe like tweak certain things that would be tailored to our workflows. And we very quickly, like in about like maybe two days, um, we got like an automated version of or an automated process for FFP1, frame MD5, compared the two, and then it gives you a judgment: is it lossless? Is it not not lossless? And this was um, an eye-opening process to say the very least, because like like coding is not easy or anything, but you don't need to be a genius to do it. Uh, you just need to like be dedicated to it and devote a lot of time because you're going to make loads of mistakes um, and your script's going to fail and fail and fail and then you just Google the right thing and then it, it works. So um, what ended up happening was, and why it was so eye-opening, was that within about like uh, about a weekend or less than a week maybe, uh, we were able to replicate everything that our vendor software could do in a batch script. And you may, yeah, but like that's not saying that we're great coders or anything, because um, we're not. Like you know, we'd be like, you know, one percent uh, coder of like Dave Rice or Joe Martinez or Speed or whoever. But it didn't do that much to begin with, you know. And like now, um, we could probably like if we did some sort of a test, you know, or like if we went to a race, we could probably knock that up in maybe um, twenty minutes or something, or even less. Again, that's not because we're great, it's because this stuff is quite simple. Um, so, like, one of the first things that we wanted to do was, like, we added a whole bunch of other things, right? But, like, we were able to automate, um, like, our technical cataloging. So, like, our database wanted a really uh, proprietary XML schema for everything to go into. And we thought, like, okay, we're going to be copy and pasting media info things for duration and codec. And so we want to be accurate, so we're going to copy and paste and not type it. So instead, like, again, it was a very crude way of doing it, and I would do it differently now. But like, really quickly, just through Googling and Stack Overflow, like, you know, just figuring out how to grab something from an XML element and then move it somewhere else. And like, we thought that was never going to be a possibility. And like, within a week, like, this was all now in play for us. And um, so we had all this like new control over our workflows and everything. Um, and then, like, it's really important that like the rest of the archive kind of bought in. And like, what's great now is that like on a management level, like my boss uh, Raylene uh, Casey, who I think some of you would have uh, seen at the Winter School, and like the head of our archive, Cassandra O'Connell, like when they speak to other archi archivists now and talk to other archives, they're like pushing open source, open formats, and it just everything works a lot easier when you have that kind of uh, support. So. Um, what was even better was that a lot of the best practices that like Colin and Anya highlighted back in the day, we were able to implement now, uh, at least to a certain degree. Like we still have a huge amount more to do. We're still trying to improve all the time and we're trying to learn more. So um, yes, this is some of the stuff that we were doing. Um, and there's like a lot of us uh, coding now. Uh, Anya's coding as well, my colleague Owen, Owen Um 
we kind of moved on to Python just because like we um, we needed to support Windows and OS X and Linux, and Python's kind of handy for that because the one script just sort of works everywhere, and it's easy to take a Python script and turn it into a binary executable as well if you want to give it to somebody that hasn't got Python installed. Um, yeah, and like we love open source formats now and software, and that's like our go-to thing is. Um, is, is it open source? Or, you know, that's like one of the first questions we ask. And as for the um, vendor software, we don't use it at all anymore. Oh, here's another image. Yeah. So this is now the robots have been created. There's FFmpeg, um, juggling cans, media conch. I don't know what it's doing. I didn't do this. Um, <laughs> um, and QC tools is yeah. Uh, these are all amazing software, and what's great is that all of those, like, we actually don't implement MediaConch at the moment, but we want to, and I want it even more now after seeing Jerome's presentation. Um, but QC tools is something that we use quite a bit, and another thing we could do is, like, there's a really beautiful thing with QC tools. It's a shame that we couldn't have had a demonstration of that today, because um, it's just a nice way to have this really quick way of doing some quality control on your files, but, like, if you just drag and drop your file in, it's the thing has got to, the graphs have got to load up and they take a while. But as part of this process, when we're making our FFV1 and we're doing this and that, like you can automate the creation of the raw XML files that are used by QC tools. So it's just whenever you open it up in QC tool that file, if that XML file is there as a sidecar, um, it just everything opens immediately. So even quality control now is quicker. And so. Before, like when we wanted to do something and it was command line, we were like, okay, where's the front end? Where's the GUI? And if there's none, we're not going to use it. Now, like if we see something that has a front end or it's got a graphical user interface, we want to find the command line version. Because then that means you can just slot it into a workflow. Um, and if you're into something like, um, you want to like, bag your file, make a library Congress bag, that's really easy to tack on to. Um, like a script at the very end, just import bag, and then you just got a little command you can use, and done. And all this stuff is like a lot more accurate as well because like, you know, it's taking some of the human elements out of it. So um, I'm not sure exactly how often this kind of thing happens in heritage institutions. I mean specifically the kind of the uh, that kind of moment with a vendor, you know, um, where you've had the vendor lock just for that bit too long and you, you're sick of the dependency. Um, and perhaps some open source solution comes on the table, but you're not sure if you're able to do it or you, you, might, you might need a, another vendor to implement the open source. <coughs> um, but like, I think it's got to happen quite a bit. So like, I don't want to scare anyone off and say that you must learn to code in order to implement FFV1 and MKV. Um, far from it, but I do think it helps. I think it helps any archivist, whether you're a moving image archivist or um, a documents librarian or something. Uh, we're now working with data, and it's good to just know how to maybe peek under the hood a little bit. So it certainly helps, but you, you don't need to. Like I, uh, there's a lot of people in our archive who uh, have never written a line of code. But they run the scripts because you just like you call the script and say make ffv1. So you just type in make ffv1 space, drag and drop in your file, and then you walk away and it does all the workflow. Or you can put in a folder and then it batches everything in the workflow. And it's up to you, whatever your workflow is, you can tweak the stuff. And there's loads of scripts available online that you can tweak. And usually the people who write those scripts, if they put them up on GitHub in the first place, it's probably because they want to engage with you, um, engage with the community and I know I would love it if somebody like asked me, oh, how I can't run this Python script, or I can't, I don't know what to do. Just get in touch on Twitter or something like that. And there's loads of other people in this room who I think would do the same. And I know this because I've done it to them repeatedly. So um, yeah, so look, that was kind of our story. Um, but you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like I don't think we even really reinvented the wheel. Like we saw the model of what. Um, Cooney in New York were doing what Dave's kind of workflows were, the kind of the microservice approach versus the, the monolith. But um, like, you can also just negotiate with your vendor. And as I said at the start, this isn't like an attack on vendors or anything. Um, like, there's so many um, open-minded 
vendors out there, like I'm thinking of Noah, like who actually engage with open source, who were like champions of open source. Um, are they? Oh, yeah, they are. <laughs> I thought someone else was laughing, not you. Um, but like, um, yeah, so some of them may take more convincing and some of them might actually try and talk you out of it. But if hopefully you'll have learned enough about the formats, about open source from this symposium to maybe know how to advocate for the formats and say like, um, but the, this is really important. It's important for long-term preservation. Um, we can't have proprietary formats, you know, we want to use this format, but you know, if we're going to lossy to transcode, maybe we might want to use lossless verification. And pretty soon, like, they're going to have to engage with some open source tools, I think. So, um, yeah, and I already mentioned, like, the, the great support that's already there in the community. So, like, there's many, many options open to you. Um, in our case, it completely transformed our archives or our archive and the archivist, it gave us this feeling of self-empowerment was maybe one of the most important things. Like we, um, we have this do-it-yourself mentality now. And like, we're, like we still work with vendors. Um, we're just not getting them to do the really simple stuff that we can do ourselves. So I would be totally open to working with a vendor who would like, or I would recommend opening, or working with a vendor that could help us with like our cataloging or something like that, or like using some better cataloging standard or a whole bunch of other stuff, right? It's, vendors can be great. Um, so yeah, so it's like, what's maybe more important than this, you know, learning to code and everything, it's that we do feel part of a community now. Um, and we like feel very kind of welcomed by the community that was already there. And like that connection, it continues to enrich our workflows and our knowledge of preservation and video formats. So like if your vendor does say no and repeatedly say, says no, then like you've got options and sometimes it can actually be a blessing in disguise. So thank you. Uh, so uh, any questions? Uh, someone in the back there? Uh, Dave? <laughs> okay. Uh, so I really think that archivists should have a good sense of control over their collections through the, the systems that they're using. And like w w one way that uh, or, or archives organizationally usually provide that control is through purchasing it through a vendor. Mm -hmm. And I think your presentation really demonstrates that the, the control as it's sold to the archivist has a, a, a barrier that you can't penetrate at some point and that you have to circumvent uh, so that you get so that now you get your, you know, now you have a lot more control because you are in this kind of free area. But I, I like a lot of these transitions are are based on, on changes to uh, Akiran. Uh, so I'm curious, though, like, what are the changes like from the organizational perspective? Like, has the organization changed its opinion on the kind of skill sets it thinks are, it's essential for its employees to have, or you know, what's what's the kind of uh, bigger picture uh, in the organization. Of sure. Um, yeah, the, the, the perception has changed significantly now. Um, like, there's dedicated time for workshops. You know, so like, I was leading um, some of my colleagues through the creation of a Python script because I'm kind of more a believer in like learning how to code through like a project rather than doing some tutorial where it just teaches you everything and then you forget it. It's teaching you how to do a shopping list or something. So, um, and also like. We go to um, there's like an eight week coding workshop in Trinity University, Trinity College that we go to, and so like the Irish Film Institute is paying for that. So it's that kind of thing. Like it, it definitely helps. Yeah. Um, and yeah, look, it's just a lot of it can just be dedicating time. That's a great way to show support. You know, it's, uh, it's time for research, time for development, and I think it's now become really obvious. Um, like especially as we're doing a lot more work with digital cinema packages and stuff, that like we can't really find the tools that suit what we want to do, so we end up writing them ourselves. That takes time. The benefits become obvious pretty quick. Um, I would say at the start it might be a hard sell to an institution, especially like it's always easier if this comes from the top down. So if there are is if there is management here, and you think this is a good idea, like. That, that would be ideal, you know, because then you could say to your staff, look, I, need, I think we all need to move in this together. And, um, but otherwise, you know, um, you can be an advocate within your institution as well. And 
uh, it can help as well if you can just show them, you know, like, um, and that's why it might be good if to maybe do some proof of concept or something, and you don't need to code it yourself. You can use like one of Dave's scripts or one of my scripts or whatever, and I'd be glad to help uh, with any technical issues or anything like that. So I don't know if that answers your question, Dave. Yeah, so well, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Um, anything else? Oh, Steve. Yes, I uh, just want to know if the code you produced yourself, uh, did you open source it as well? It's completely proprietary and under a license. <laughs> <laughs> it's up on GitHub. On, um, is there a quick way to go back to the start of the reveal? Doc? Okay, we're going all the way back. Is it, um, huh? is it your own? Peter is the best. You can also press escape and you get an overview of yeah. all the slides. Peter is always helping me. Um, so the, oh, I don't have it there. Okay, github.com forward slash Kieran J O L. But uh, my name is probably a bit funny. We'll tweet. What yeah, I'll tweet the it. License? Um, some, actually, I don't have a license on everything, but uh, where I do have a license, I have the MIT license. And the reason I took that was I saw that Dave used that. <laughs> so, um, it seems pretty open. Uh, Kieran, can you? Yeah, no, there, there should be, especially now that, like, initially I was the only one who was yeah. committing, and so it just gets a bit weird now when Anya and Owen are committing something and it's to Kieran J. Well, um, so yeah, we should, hopefully. I would love to know if there was a way to, like, I don't know if this is possible to, um, oh, we could just fork the repository. Uh, there's an organization. Yeah, you can try oh, yeah? to organization. Yeah, and that's on a per repository basis, so, yeah. yes. Great. Um, Herman. Uh, it's a great presentation, and I uh, like the aspect because um, it's the same kind of how it started with the community. Uh, I remember about <laughs> 10 years ago, I made a, quite, uh, a presentation and it was made with a similar message and with the same view in the eyes. One comment uh, about if they say no, we have options. Mm. Uh, I would just like to add. That's an excellent point, yeah. Let them know what's out there, you know. And Peter Boostinger. Um, Thanks, Peter. I almost cried. <laughs> <laughs> I almost cried throwing out here. Two questions. One is, um, is there any package or something and it works for them. I think it's when they want to move on and they do get told no. You know, that we're not going to change our software for you or unless you know you pay us a huge amount of money or something. It's probably at the point when it, they're looking for change anyway. And it's like, okay, we just move to another vendor and they're gonna give us the new um, my advice to an institution is it like what would I say to them? Uh, it would be I guess just engage with the community that's already there. Um, see what these scripts can do already. Um, it's sometimes it's best to actually talk to somebody, I think, to try and get in touch with somebody in an archive. Because um, what's important as well is to see the potential. It's one thing to say, oh, well, this creates that kind of an archival package. But to really get a sense that, like, okay, we can sculpt this completely. And we can change it, like, every couple of weeks if we want, when we realize we 
you know, we can now do frame shell ones or something like that, you know. Um, I don't know, it's difficult for me to think off the top of my head, really, like, um, I, I think there's a large role to be played by all of us here in the room, in a way, you know, like, I'm a big believer in advocacy and just talking up and saying, even if it's you're at a low level in your organization, just to say, um, look, I, I think there's something here. I think there's, we should at least investigate this. Let's maybe talk to these other archivists. It doesn't always have to be, um, the ball doesn't have to start rolling from the top down. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I can add a quick answer from Peter or just comment about the question, but I mean, one thing I enjoy about this field so much is that, like, I mean, we have such specific uh, values and, and tools and needs uh, that, you know, there's not often, like, people to provide the tools that we need, so archivists have kind of historically been, been hackers, like, I, I mean, I like seeing, like, you know, presentations where archivists are like, uh, you know, filing down uh, the gears of a projector to handle shrunken film, or like, mm -hmm. uh, temporarily blocking the, the laser inside of a UMAC tape so that it won't shine through like the oxide that fell off and cut the deck off. Like, like archi archivists have had to hack in this kind of, for analog media for, for decades, and it's, it, I mean, it's quite disappointing that when the same community offers such skepticism on just moving the same type of hacking into the digital environment. Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, it's, you cannot responsibly uh, do this kind of conservation to very damaged and obsolete media without hacking, and I kind of think it's, it's an essential part of our work, analog or digital. It's true, um, I think you used that phrase a while ago, you made a comparison between, um, <coughs> you know, the, the film archivist and his splicer in the light box, you know, and you have these like, really like frame level um, repairs and tools, and that's like, you know, sometimes working on the command line and maybe working on, with a hex editor to change, you know, a, a, a broken QuickTime header or something. That this is a direct equivalent, you know, and um, that's the kind of stuff you're not going to outsource to a vendor. You're not going to say, fix my header, you know. It's like, you're better off learning that stuff yourself. And that's even something like hex editing. I don't know how to hex edit now, you know. Like, I... Uh, I um, yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's always room for improvement, I guess. But yeah, no, Dave, I think you're asking your question. Is there anything else? Or I should sit down and move on to the own conference. All right, thanks so very much. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're going to uh, take a break so we can reset up the room. Because uh, we're going to reset up the room, um, we're just going to move some of these tables in here and uh, have some tables in here.